Hello and welcome to this video on the difference between uh, rotting and fermentation. Uh, while it might seem obvious, fermentation is good, rotting is bad, uh, things are not so simple. Uh, the whole point of this video is triggered by a line uh, to that effect uh, from uh, Food Wars, or Shokugeki no Soma. It goes along the lines of fermentation and rotting are the same thing, but one creates desirable products while the other does not. Uh, we don't necessarily agree with that summary, let's say. While the two are seen as different, both in application and scenario, we would very much argue that they are the same thing, but one is intentional where the other is not. A simple example is vinegar. Vinegar is made by acetobacter converting either sugar or alcohol into acetic acid. When planned and desired, this is good as you get what you want. When unplanned, your nice-to-be wine, beer or cider becomes not beer, wine or cider, Rather, it becomes wine vinegar, malt vinegar, or cider vinegar. The end result may still be desirable or useful, but it is not intended. For that reason, we can look at this with a range of example circumstances, and not just because you have different means and methods of fermenting for similar things, but because they show the intended, unintended, and unwanted results it can very much still be a good thing or a bad thing, but they are not the intended results. Let's start with a seemingly simple example that quickly spirals out of control. Aspergillus oryzae. This is the microbial organism used to turn the long starch chains in rice into shorter and fermentable polysaccharides. If this was all oryzae did, we wouldn't have anything more to say, and there would be better ways to handle the problem. Instead, oryzae adds amino acids and other products to the rice as well. These are where we get the intended versus unintended difference. If left for just enough time, the orizia will add just enough amino acids and other flavors such as amami to be appreciated. If left for too long, or too great an amount is used, you get these flavors to an excessive degree. This leads to an uh, unpleasant taste at best, and a wasted batch of sake to be at worst. And the difference with this can be a few hours to a day, that's literally it. Somewhere between, say, 2 or 3 hours and 24 hours. So little time can drastically alter the flavour, and possibly the quality of the sake. It goes from being a premium quality sake to a waste quality sake. The kimchi is similar, not because it rots, but because the rot to some extent is what people want. And by that we mean the flavors which would normally be seen as extreme or overwhelming uh, can become rather prized. Like vinegar and orizia, kimchi operates on a specific bacterium, for the most part. It's lactobacillus. It produces lactic acid. That acid flavors kimchi in part and certainly contributes greatly to its stability in storage. The longer the kimchi stands for, the stronger that flavor becomes. The challenge is that an extreme flavor in kimchi can also be seen as uh, too much. Having fermented too far and begun to, well, in the views of some, rot. Uh, this is uh, still technically the right process, but the intention was met and then exceeded. And as such, technically it has begun to rot, because you have met what you wanted to do, that is, it's fermented up to a point, and then it kept going, after which the, uh, let's say, a division as to who would find this enjoyable and who wouldn't, sees a rather drastic shift, with many finding it unpalatable. Of course, there are times and ways in which your intentions are damned no matter what. And this is especially true with meat. A salami or similar sausages and bacon are both examples of this. As a rule, salami or any other sausage has a culture added to it. This culture is a mixture of nitrates for microbial selection and a small population of desired bacteria for flavor. By suppressing unwanted bacterial species and inoculating the salami with the desired species, you get the right result. Hopefully. To get the right result, you have to ensure moisture levels are the right, temperature is right, the media is right, and so on. When these things are even off by a little bit, you begin to get issues. Now understand how far wrong they are from your intended target or what you need to have, will directly correlate to how drastically things alter from being fermentation or curing to rotting. Understand, the issues are not necessarily driven by rot, 
but by curing or fermenting the sami going too far or too well in some ways, which is definitely not an instance of rotting in any conventional sense of the word, except if we were to go back to that first definition, let's say. The inoculum you use for this sort of thing is a group of bacteria chosen to add flavour to the salami or sausage. If they have a too free an opportunity to grow, they will grow and do so beyond your control, essentially creating a bacterial culture. Technically, you want some bacteria to grow in the salami. This is what keeps the population alive and generating flavour. What you don't want is too much growth. That leads to you eating a lot of bacteria every time you consume some of the salami, the result of which is food poisoning. The other issue is the bacterium, if growing out of control, begin to break down the meat and any other content within your salami or sausage. This is where the line between fermentation and rotting begins to blur. Strictly speaking, the end result is no longer being achieved now, but as long as you don't get that far, you are technically achieving the desired result, the intention of uh, limiting the process and consequential intention of keeping microbial population was not achieved. And there's the issue. You have added that flavour, and then gone beyond that threshold. This is much like cheese, whether it's hard cheese or soft cheese. The ideas are very similar. A cheese requires the addition of a culture. The exact culture will vary based on the cheese style you're going to be making. It nearly always includes bacteria. Less common in hard cheese, but far more common with soft cheese, is a malt culture too. This means you now have two ways of the food or beverage to fail, rather than just one. First, we have the bacterial element. The process of creating cheese should only involve the bacteria adding flavour. This is controlled through a combination of environment and conditions. By keeping cheese in a cool but not cold environment with minimal moisture, and the desired bacteria can grow, and they will grow slowly. The other thing you do is add salt. The salt slows down or stops bacteria from growing. Sometimes you will want the bacteria to grow stronger. For example, Stilton cheese is notorious for this. It has a very strong the flavour from bacteria and their activities. For some, this could be seen as a cheese going bad and beginning to rot, as the flavour is quite extreme. In theory, you could argue any cheese could become Stilton or similar by the same process. That is, the cheese sits for too long, or just a bit too long, at the wrong temperature, or without enough salt, and that leads to the cheese becoming too flavourful, through the bacteria multiplying and working to uh, add their little bit. But all the bacteria adding their individual little bits builds up very quickly, and it becomes too much. The same thing happens with mould. Unlike bacteria, most cheeses try to grow mould throughout it or at least somewhat throughout it. In fact, this is a core part of, say, blue cheese. The mould is what makes it blue cheese. If the mould failed to grow, it would be considered rotting. Not because something did happen, but because nothing happened. You need that blue veins or rhizomes growing throughout it. They are what make up the significant and very defining feature of something like blue cheese. A commensurate effect from mould is that it keeps some of the bacteria in check. This is especially true of cheeses such as blue cheese, where a form of penicillin mould is used. The penicillin keeps bacteria growth down and ensures it only works in a smaller area and to a far lesser degree, meaning it doesn't only become a great mushy moist mess, but rather pockets of uh, flavour kept in a reasonably solid shape. It means the cheese remains cheese and not slop. Obviously, if the... Uh, let's say, uh, fungi or mold in this case, it didn't provide that beneficial effect, you would have, well, mess, and therefore not have cheese and it would have rotted. But also, on the other hand, you don't want the mold to be overly active, because that would prevent it from working, and this brings us to the point of, the intention is to have it do something, but not necessarily everything. And by keeping the bacteria in check, they work enough that you get the flavour you want, but not too much. On the other hand, they do need to be able to do something. Yogurt is another example that's easy to apply and understand that way. Strictly speaking, you want the bacteria present in yogurt. Without this, you would only get curdled milk. The way may be interesting, but it's not very nice alone, 
That's why it gets turned into cheese rather than being consumed as is. So you want enough bacteria to get the yogurt to be flavorful, but not so flavorful as to be inedible, or worse yet, cause food poisoning. You could argue that uh, once yogurt is fermented enough, it is done. The problem is that you can't easily stop yogurt from fermenting further. You could technically do so with pasteurization, but that would affect the final taste and texture. So you have to, in a manner of speaking, find less destructive solutions. That does mean leaving the yogurt to ferment for a time further, but this is done at a low level by reducing the temperature of the yogurt through refrigeration. That keeps the bacteria from being active or creating more flavour. If not kept in check, they keep on working, as intended, to an extent, and just not when intended. And after a certain point, even if it was intended, well, it becomes effectively food poisoning. So, yeah, that obviously has a certain threshold. The last example we'll use is a sourdough bread. This is far more subtle, not because the bread strictly goes bad, but that it brings together many of the previously mentioned problems. Sourdough combines fungi and bacteria, a yeast or cerevisiae, as a fungi, and lactobacillus, or a bacteria. The yeast gives rise to the bread and adds some flavour and other factors we've described in their previous video. Lactobacillus produces flavour, in particular the sour part of sourdough, through lactic acid. You want both these things to happen as it makes the bread both rise and have a nice flavour. The problem is you can go too far. The bread can taste extremely sour, be overproofed and therefore not bake right. This is generally as a result of leaving the bread to proof or rise too long, which despite being the desired process, the results are not what you want. So procedurally correct, but end result is wrong. On the other hand, you can leave sourdough to proof for a longer time frame, for example in a refrigerator, where the yeast is less active but lactobacillus is somewhat more active. I mean, you get more of that uh, strong biting flavour of the sour part of sourdough, but it hasn't yet had a chance to arise. Of course, this is a case of uh, more actively intervening in the process as it go on. But you can see how the end result can work, or not work, or you can try and fiddle with it. This is why we argue that rotting is the end result, or the intended result not being obtained. Fermenting, by contrast, is when the desired result is obtained. To be clear, that does not mean the best result, but the intended result. Much like a question of did it go left or right, not did it get all the way down where you wanted it to go, just did it go in the general right direction. As you can see, a rotting does not necessarily require that food be obviously bad. It can very much be the outcome is not what you intended, or in some cases that you would find edible. For some, uh, this can lead to a new product that you uh, effectively salvage the waste from, or all the work you put into it, but it does not give you what you want. On the other hand, it often leads to effectively wasting the entirety of what you've tried to do. Uh, once cheese has gone bad, it's essentially unsalvageable. On the other hand, something like vinegar can be made from, say, a cider that hasn't quite fermented correctly. On the other hand, if, say, a kimchi has gone too far, there's a good chance you may not be able to eat it, but you might know someone who is fond of that, so for them it hasn't rotted as such, it's just a better version of what they wanted, a better fermentation. Of course, this is very subjective, and of course very much a case of individual intentions and purposes, which is somewhat more nebulous than the original definition, but we feel it's more accurate to what's going on. Thank you for watching this video. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please do post any comments, questions, or suggestions you have below.